Welcome to this lecture on binary images. I want to talk today about what binary images are and what are common operations that we are doing on those binary images. This will involve things such as computing connected components or performing a simple distance transform on those binary images, but also basic morphological operators such as opening and closing. And these are th operations that we can do on those binary images in order to analyze those images or in order to change those images so that they have a certain purpose or can be used for a certain purpose. But first, let us start with explaining what a binary image is. A binary image is actually something very simple. It's basically an image which only consists of two colors, the color pure white and pitch black. So we just have two possible intensity values, zero and one. Or if we think about it in terms of regular images that you use on your computer, it's the intensity value zero and the intensity value 255. One for black and the other one for white. But the important thing is here that we only have two different types of intensity uh, values, namely pitch black, zero, or pure white. And we only have those two colors available. Of course, if you think about a photo, that's a very limited color space. And uh, probably most of the images that you will be taking with your camera won't look nice if you use a binary image format. There are, however, applications where binary images are fine. We can work with it. If you, for example, think of recognizing handwritten characters as a few examples of characters from or numbers from 0 to 9, which are shown over here, in order to perform the detection task, we can actually do this purely based on binary images. And there are other purposes why binary images are important. If you think about masking, you want to mask out something or written text, you can actually represent that text really well with just black and white color. So a couple of examples are, for example, scanned documents. So if you have papers, you want to scan those papers, at least for the text itself, you can go quite far with just using two possible intensity values, these handwritten digits, or masks um, that use an operation such as background extraction. So for example, if you have a background image like the one shown over here, and then you have a second image taken with a person here in the foreground, then by computing the difference of those images or maybe computing a mask, you can either highlight which areas of the image have changed. So for example, here the human and also some areas here caused by the shadow of the human on the ground. Um, <clears throat> or you can use this information not just for detecting change, but for masking out certain operations that you only want to do in the foreground or that you only want to do in the background. So there are a large number of different reasons why you may want to work with um, those binary images. And we will look into some very common problems. The first one is computing connected components. So identifying those regions which are connected to each other. For example, that person over here. We may want to be able to identify that person as one single region. And in order to estimate that, it's important to know which are the pixels that actually form one object or belong together. And that is something that we can do with computing something which is called connected components. So basically, those components of the image, let's say those white pixels, which are connected with each other. That's kind of the simplest, one of the simple operations or standard operations that we typically do with it. We um, may use this, for example, in the context of this handwritten digits um, by saying uh, we want to identify what is a digit itself. So what is a one, what is a two, what is a three? In order to separate them in a document, we may want to identify the connected components in order to estimate which parts of, um, let's say, uh, some white pixels actually belong to one single digit. Um, just computing those connected components may not be sufficient because sometimes we have maybe written two digits very close to each other so that they're actually connected, or we have digits or especially characters which are broken up into two non-connected -com um, components. But computing connected components is a first step towards this and the technique that is used in a large number of different activities. Um, and therefore, it's worth investigating a little bit how we can compute connected components within a binary image. So in an image where we only have zeros and ones, only black pixels and white pixels. For that, we need first to understand what is a connected component, what should that be? Um, if you think about a continuous space, um, and we have an object like this gray area over here, the question here, what is a connected component? And a connected component can actually be defined by the way these are all uh, the, the set of points. We have two points, A and B, and A and B are connected with each other 
if um, there is a pass from A to B that just passes through that single component. So in this gray example over here, we have a point A here, a point B here, and the point A and B can be connected through a line um, that only passes through those gray areas. So for example, the area down here and the area in here are not connected because there's no pass from C to B that only passes through the gray areas um, without passing through the white areas. And so then all points, all pairs of points for which this holds um, form a connected component. So that's a definition that we may use in a continuous space, um, but it's something which becomes already a bit more tricky if we think about images, best because we have here intensity values that are aligned in a grid. So we basically have a uniform grid of zeros and ones, of black pixels and white pixels. And there, the connectivity is already um, a little bit more tricky to define, or at least um, there it is ambiguous. There are different ways for defining if two pixels are actually connected. And we can start, for example, with a so-called N4 or an N8 neighborhood in order to define which pixels which are next to each other are actually connected. So in the N4 neighborhood, then for this pixel here in the middle, um, we have four neighbors, uh, north, south, um, east, and west, as four different um, neighbors. It's called N4 neighborhood. But I could also, uh, for example, define the neighborhood as a so-called N8 neighborhood, which is shown over here, where also the diagonal elements are connected. So in this case, this center pixel here is connected to all those eight pixels surrounding it. And for example, here we could easily have um, a diagonal line, and this line would be one connected component, whereas in this case, a diagonal line would not result in a connected component, at least if it is only one pixel um, thick. If it's, of course, thicker than one pixel, then we would also generate here, through kind of a staircase pattern, uh, a connection. But if you just think about a single pixel, there are different ways for defining a neighborhood, and the, let's say, two very popular ones are the N4 as well as the N8 neighborhood. We can specify them also a little bit more formally. For example, the N4 neighborhood, if I think about indices i and j, then if I want to compute the neighbors of the pixel location ij, for example, if this is um, ij, then the neighborhood, the N4 neighborhood of ij, is defined by this set of four pixels, which is basically subtracting or adding one to either the first or the second coordinate of my index. So, um, I can either increment i or j or decrement i or j, but not at the same time. This will give me four possible connections, um, right, left, up, down, or north, south, east, west, depending how I want to um, name that. But it's basically this form of neighborhood. It's also called the city block neighborhood or Manhattan neighborhood. Um, of course, Manhattan, basically the streets in Manhattan are kind of this grid-like structure. And if you want to move around on those roads, you can only go north, south, east, west. Therefore, it's also called the Manhattan neighborhood. And this is a standard neighborhood that we will refer to here as the N4 neighborhood. In contrast to this, the N8 neighborhood, of course, has all those elements which are in the N4 neighborhood, but has four additional um, neighbors as well. So besides the N4 neighborhood, we also have um, the, uh, the other neighbors where we ha can have increments and decrements in both sides of the indices, indices at the same point in time, so I and J in order to get all those eight possible areas here, so also that also in the end, the diagonal pixels are connected. And with this definition of the either an four or an eight neighborhood, I can specify the neighboring pixels for a given pixel, the neighborhood of an individual pixel. And based on this simple definition of the neighborhood of an individual pixel, we can then generalize this to the other pixels and then um, generate, in the end, connected components. So for example, we have an image over here, which is purely white, and we have our, in this case, gray, uh, it could also be black, foreground pixels over here. So the question is, what are the connected components in here? In this case, it's fairly straightforward. We will have one component over here and one kind of this L-shaped component over here. So we expect to get two components out. So the question is, how do we determine those connected components in here? So one way is to use the neighborhood information. We have to use this neighborhood information, but treating this image basically as a graph. So this is kind of the standard approach of doing this. That means for every dark pixel or black pixel or gray pixel in this example, we generate a node in that graph, and those nodes are connected with each other if 
um, they are in line with the either N4 or N8 neighborhood. So this is one way of specifying this. So we again have here our, our image and then we can build actually the uh, graph structure here where this is kind of, let's say this is exactly one pixel each, then this would be a result of the N8 neighborhood because here we have diagonal connection. So those, this graph here describes this L and this subgraph here describes this um, horizontal line. And then by computing the connected components in this graph structure, by labeling them, we would be able to identify which components are connected or are not connected. And so I could use this by, for example, computing path from all the points in this component and see they pass through the same component um, where there's no path from here to here, for example. Or we can also exploit directly the, the pixel information, knowing that these are pixels, which in the end will lead to a little bit more efficient algorithm um, where we, the, the neighbors are directly defined. And the output of such an algorithm could be, for example, for the N8 neighborhood here, this is the component number one. So we have a one, one, one over here and twos over here saying those pixels which are labeled with two belong to the component number two and those pixels labeled with one belong to the component number one. So the question is how can I derive an algorithm which takes this as an input and outputs this kind of component image, so to say, where we just have um, indices where uh, for the individual components, and let's say all the non-fill elements here, uh, you can see, for example, as zero, or we don't have a component information available here. Uh, what we want to have is an algorithm which takes this as an input and outputs this part or this component image over here. So how does that work? So we can very informally describe actually an algorithm which does that by saying, okay, how do we start? We mm, select one node in this graph, um, which is so in kind of this graph structure here. So either we select um, a pixel which is black or the corresponding node that we create in our, gra in our graph structure and label it. We just give it a number. So for example, if we pick one of those guys over here, one, two, three, just pick one of them randomly and start with assigning it a new label, the label number one. What we're then doing, we are checking all the unlabeled neighbors of that point in this graph structure. That means taking the edge to the left and taking the edge to the right hand side. This defines the neighbor, uh, the neighbors of that pixel that we have just selected. And then we are assigning the same label to this, uh, to this neighbor. And then we kind of repeat this process by checking the neighbors of the neighbors. And then again, checking the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors. And so on and so forth, we repeat this process until all of the neighbors are labeled. There's no unlabeled neighbor which is left. Once we are done, we say, okay, this component is now completed. Then we go back to step number one. We select another so far unlabeled node and assign it a new label, so the label number two. And then we repeat the process. We take into account all the neighbor, neighbors of that labeled point and assign it the same label. And then we re repeat this process over and over again, checking all the neighbors, labeling all the neighbors, taking the neighbors into account until there are no unlabeled neighbor, neighbors which are left. And this is also called the brush fire algorithm, which basically is, creates like a fire which runs through this component. Um, if you kind of illustrate this and labels or burns, so to say, all the components uh, all the elements which are part of that component. So it's kind of an informal approach how that works. And the only thing we need to do is we need to have these labels, we need to be able to label nodes, and we need to have this neighborhood information and then I can progress through all those neighbors. We can also write that down slightly more formally as a connected component algorithm as is shown over here. And I want to briefly go through this algorithm which goes as one of the key algorithms for computing connected component, at least in its simplest form of the graph. So we assume we have our input image, which is a binary image only consisting of zeros and ones. And what we want to output is a so-called component image K, which basically provides a label between zero and K, where large capital K is a number of components and um, provides us with, an, with a label in form of a number of an integer number that tells us which pixel belongs to which component. And we can start this by setting K to zero and initializing the component image filling completely full of zeros. And then we simply look for one, it doesn't matter which one, but just one pixel, which where the binary image, so the input image bij is one, that means it's a black pixel, um, and where the component image, it has a zero, so it's kind of from the initialization, which is unlabeled so far. So k equals zero means it's unlabeled so far. And we take exactly the pixel that we have found 
and add it to our set S. And the set S here is the set of tuples of kind of XY or IJ pixel locations, which I still need to process, for which I need, still need to check for neighbors and, um, um, and, and, and repeatedly label this point as well as its neighbors. Let me say, okay, we start with this one as our starting point now and set the co component uh, the component needs k to increase by one, so from zero to one if it's the first one, and then label this pixel, it gets kind of the component index k. So the first pixel is now labeled here because we are overriding the position ij in the label um, image or component image k and provide it with, in the first set, the number one. And then we have a, a loop in here which says, okay, for every unlabeled foreground, um, so for, for, the, uh, for this element that we have, um, in, in S we compute the neighbors uh, of that set. So we want to compute the neighbors for the points in the set S, so which right now is our initial point. And under the constraint that the, um, it should be a black pixel, so P, Dij is black and its component is not, uh, is not labeled. So we are basically determining all the neighbors to the, to the current pixel, which is black, but has not a component index so far, so it's unlabeled. And then we simply iterate over all points in this set, or all pixels in this set, and label it with the same index. So we basically write the current integer number k into the component image. And then we take those uh, the neighbors and add them to that set k. So the set k is a set of points which grows, which are um, the, the points still, or which are labeled, are still under consideration. Um, that means I still need to check for neighbors in S and see if there are more neighbors around. And then I iterate this process again. Are there more neighbors that exist which are unlabeled, a black unlabeled pixel? If so, I'm uh, labeling uh, all the points in this neighborhood set appropriately and add the neighbors that I determined to that set. In this case, I'm repeating this process over and over again until the set of neighbors, of unlabeled neighbors, is zero. And then I have completely colored this single component. So I'm done with this component, and then I'm saying un unless there are no unlabeled foreground pixels exist anymore, um, I go on to the beginning, I'm looking for a new starting point, so for kind of seeding a new component, um, I'm just checking for one unlabeled pixel, which is black, select this and then simply repeat this process, always increasing this index k. And so I'm creating one component after the other. First component, second component, third component, and so on and so forth. And this is kind of a standard approach to do this. So if you have examples, so this is another example, very simple example image of your four by five pixel image. Then what I would like to have, for example, are those component labeled as one and this component here labeled as two. And we can now go through this algorithm as an example and showcase how these individual points here are labeled. So we start with our outer loop, so slightly smaller here, but it's basically copy-paste from the two loops from the algorithm shown beforehand. Um, so I first start finding a so far unlabeled pixel. And in this example, I just randomly pick one of the, of the black pixels, so three, 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 three. So this would be this pixel in my example, so I'm starting with this pixel over here. Okay, the first step that I'm doing in this loop, I'm, I'm, I'm labeling it with the one, so I'm writing the one in here, and then looking for all the neighbors that exist. So all the neighbors exi that exist for the elements in S consisting of three, three, are three, two, and three, four. So this pixel and this pixel. So those two pixels are the, neighbor, are the neighbors of this pixel. Okay, so I'm labeling both of them and adding them to the set S. So those which I have already been labeled, have already labeled, which is this one over here. So my set S um, consists now of those three pixels. And then I'm repeating this process again in the inner loop. I have my compute my neighbors. So these are the uh, neighbors of S, so all the neighbors of these points. So there's no neighbor here, no neighbor here, but this element here has one, two, three neighbors. So these are the neighbors 2-2, two, two, which is this one, 3-1, one, which is this one, and 4-2, which is this one. So these are now my neighbors. So then I'm labeling them, writing one in here, adding them to S, and then there are no neighbors of that set S which are so far unlabeled. So this is um, the empty set, and then the inner loop is completed. That means this component is fully labeled. 
And then I'm again going to the beginning and I'm looking for a new set, uh, uh, a new pixel which is black but unlabeled. And there we only have this pixel left. So I'm adding a two in here, a new component. So I have my S as one five over here, one five. This is my S. And then I'm looking for the neighbors. This, there's no neighbors in one five because these are all white pixels. So I'm done, I'm completing the loop and then there's no further unlabeled foreground pixel left. So all the black pixels are labeled and I'm getting my one component one over here, my component two over here and all the pixels are labeled. And with this, I'm actually completed my approach and labeled all the images. And this is the simplest form of computing the connected components here for our binary image. If you look to this algorithm, um, this is actually an algorithm which works on kind of general graphs. So I can use the same technique, just kind of the coloring may look, may, may work a little bit different that I don't put output the output image but a graph structure. But in general, we haven't exploited any specific information towards this image. So um, that, that it is, the input is actually an image or binary image. So we can actually use this algorithm on general graphs. So the question is, can we actually do better by exploiting that we, our input is actually an image and not an arbitrary graph? What's the difference between this input image and the defined neighborhood and an arbitrary graph? In an arbitrary graph, I could have connections between um, nodes which are very far away, which doesn't hold for my binary image. Because in my binary image, I only define the N4 or an eight neighborhood. That means a pixel, uh, has only neighbors which are nearby, at least one pixel difference. It's not that I have a pixel over here, another pixel over here, and I create a neighborhood between them, which I could do in a general graph. So the, um, we haven't exploited yet kind of that the neighborhood in this image is defined in a very systematic manner. And the question is, can we do this in order to come up with a better algorithm? So is there a property we can exploit in order to generate a more efficient algorithm? And the way I formulated the question, it, the answer is of course yes, because we can take this N4 or N8 neighborhood definition into account, knowing that we can't create arbitrary neighbors. Only, it's a very local neighborhood, only the at max eight pixel in its surrounding can contribute to that neighborhood information. And this allows us to revise this algorithm, define a new algorithm which explicitly exploits this, and in this case, in this way is able to more efficiently um, generate, compute those connected components, which is um, a key in order to come up with efficient algorithms. And finding these connected components that exploits the grid structure um, is a very kind of standard task to do. It's a standard question that you may also get in job interviews if you do small coding problems, finding connected components um, in, in a, exploiting the property that is actually an image is something which is very common, a very common problem. Okay, so the question is now how can we do that better? And I said we do that by ex better exploiting the neighborhood information in here. And the idea is actually fairly simple. So the first thing is we know it's a grid. So we have this 2D structure and we can basically pass through the image by running through one pixel after the other. And we only know, when we know while we have that pass, that for every pixel we are inspecting, the neighbors are actually very close. There's a very local information that we jump over the whole image. So if I pass through the image in an intelligent way, I can reduce the number of possible pixels I need to inspect as potential um, neighbors. And if I do it in a smart way, in a smart order, um, taking the potential neighbors that I have visited already and those which I couldn't have visited yet through this path through the image into account, but I can do it just with one path through the image, I'm actually able to compute all the connected components without actually going back for that. Um, so the idea is here to um, go through the image in one pass and generate a label. So for a temporary label, it may not be the final label, for every pixel that I'm expecting, only taking into account the neighborhood information of the pixels I've visited so far. So I start with the image and run through the image from top to bottom. So first row, second row, third row, fourth row, and so on. And for every pixel I'm inspecting, I'm only taking the neighbors into account of those points which I have already visited. So I say, okay, I know the kind of component ID of that pixel already. And I kind of, kind of grow those components. 
as it will turn out, there are, in some situations, is ambiguous um, because there could be structures where I create actually two uh, IDs or two uh, component IDs for the same component. So I need a second correction step later on to fix those potentially small number of, um, of mistakes that I have done, but this results in the end in a more efficient algorithm. And I'm doing this with kind of an equivalence table by saying, okay, for example, component number eight and component number 15 are actually the same component. Something I can actually figure out on the way. Okay, let's make a concrete example and show how that looks like. Maybe then it's um, easier to understand. So what I'm doing, I'm starting here in the first row and I'm basically running through the image row by row. Right? And so right now I'm kind of here. That's what I'm doing. And for every pixel, I'm actually, I have three different situations. So this here done for the N4 neighborhood in this example. I can be in situation number A, where I said, okay, this pixel, so I'm only interested in the black pixel. If the pixel is white, I can just skip over it. If the pixel is a black pixel, like here in this setup, and the only two neighbors in terms of pixels that exist and which I've visited so far is the one on top and the one on the left. So these are the two potential ones that I have. Okay, so I inspect those two pixels and say, okay, what happens? They are both white. Now, both white means um, they, they don't belong to the foreground I'm interested in. I'm only interested in the black pixels. Um, so that means I can start a new component over here because this is, a, this is a black pixel which is not connected to anything else I know so far. So I'm creating a new label and assign a new label over here. So this happened, for example, in the situation where I'm, where I'm over here. Um, this is the first um, pixel I'm visiting. Here, uh, first black one on top and to the left, they are both white. So this is a new one. I'm creating a new ID, in this case the ID number one, and label that one with the ID number one. Okay, that's the first situation that I can have. The second situation that I can have, if I'm kind of in this pixel right now, is that either both pixels on top and left are already labeled and have the same ID. Only the one on top is labeled or only the one on the left is labeled and um, then I have just one ID. So what I then do, I'm just copying the ID over. So for example, if I'm here in this situation, that okay, there's white one on top, but there's a one on the left, a labeled one, so just copy over the label. So I'm copy the one over here, and so on. Copy, 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 and so on. So I'm creating these row of ones, or partial row of ones, through this copy operation. This is a step B. And I'm continuing, continuing, here in this point, okay, Again, I'm here, this is again the situation A, create a new index, one is a two now, label all of them with two. Until I'm here in that situation. When I'm in this situation, I'm actually coming to this situation C, which says, okay, I'm here at that point, which is a black pixel, and the one on top is black, is labeled, and the one left is labeled, but the, the label is not the same. And this exactly happens for the first time here at that point. So, I can either copy the two or the one. But through this pixel, this component which is so far labeled with two and this component which is so far labeled with one will actually get connected. So what I'm doing, I'm just taking one of those two, so either the one or the two. In this example, I took the kind of the largest label, but I could also take the smallest label that doesn't make a difference over here. I just take that label and continue with this label, storing in my mind that actually one and two are actually the same component. So what, if a component label is one or is two, it doesn't matter, it's the same component. And I'm creating something which I call an equivalence table. So a table which says component ID one and component ID two are the same, they are our equivalent. So I'm actually building up an equivalence table that in this case illustrated here, this is in, well, I passed through the whole image or up to that point over here, where I say which components are the same. So let's go through this example and um, kind of see how that works. So I'm Passing through this image, I was now here, so this created a one. I'm storing that one and two are identical. So these are the first two elements of my um, equivalence table. And then I'm processing, white pixel, white pixel, white pixel, not interested in, black pixel. Okay, only the top neighbor is the black, so this is this situation over here. So I'm copying over the one, and then I'm, I'm in this situation where left and top are both one, they're identical, it's this situation over here. Copying over the one, and I'm progressing like this. I create a label number three, one, one, I create label number four, label number five, and label number one, label number six. And then I'm here in that situation, um, and I'm saying that I'm this, this six over here, so um, I'm copying over this six, 
but six and five must be identical. So six and five are added to this equivalence table. And I'm progressing over here, continuing labeling with six, but I know six and five are identical. Now I'm in this situation, I create a seven, and now I'm in this situation. I'm again in situation C. Say, okay, is one here, a seven over here. Let's copy over the seven, but let's write down that one and seven are identical. So by now I know one, two, and seven are identical. And then I complete this process over and over again, and adding here also the eight and the six, so I know that eight, six, and five are identical. So eight, eight, six, and five are here in this equivalence table. So what I'm basically doing, I'm going through this image, providing those labels, and then have an equivalence table so that later on I only need to revisit these components. In the worst case, I do a second path through the image where I kind of generate this consistent label that I replace all the twos and the sevens by ones and all the six and the eights by five, for example. So it's basically two passes through the image. I kind of can create a fully labeled image um, which has the same unique IDs. And this is an operation which is faster than the simple connected component algorithms that I've actually described before. Okay, we can also do this now a bit more formally um, and have the full algorithm written down in here in the same way as we did it before, but now kind of the advanced algorithm in a more formal way. So far we've done it actually quite informally. Okay, so we start again with my binary image bij, which consists of zeros and ones, and I want to output my component image k, and capital K is number of components which are out there, um, so, which, so that I have a unique label of my, um, of my components over here. Okay, so um, what I now first need to do, I create an equivalence table and um, setting this equivalence table uh, to the empty set because in the beginning I don't have any equivalence. And then I'm not iterating, I'm not searching kind of for this new component to look at as I did before. I have now exploit the grid structure that I can run, go from path through the image just once um, first going through all the rows and then through all the commons, uh, columns and visit in every pixel individually. So these are those two outer loops over here. These two outer loops are basically iterating over every pixel, visiting every pixel. And then for every pixel I, I inspect its, its intensity value, say is it a one, so is it a black pixel in this example over here, or a foreground pixel, and then um, I'm, um, if this is the case, I say, okay, now I need to think what I'm doing because now I start, need to start to label. So I create here this set, um, this set A, and this set A is basically the small set of already labeled neighbors. So if I go back, so basically this set over those two elements here are this set A. Um, so I add all the neighbors of this pixel ij um, that could have been already labeled, so it's a left in the top pixel over here. They are added to A, um, but only if it is a neighbor which is black. So if it's a white one, I'm, I'm not adding it. And then I can do the check. Okay, is the, what's the size of this set A? Either it's zero, it means I have no um, black pixel as my neighbors. If this is the case, um, if there has no neighbors which are black, perfect, I'm starting a new ID. So I'm creating a new component and labeling this one in the component. If this is not the case, then I can say, okay, what happens if uh, A is larger or equal, or so larger than zero? So it means larger or equal than, equal than one. That means I'm either in the situation B or C over here. Okay. So what I can do is I say, okay, I'm just copying over um, the component, take, for example, the minimum, or in the example before I used the maximum number um, of the component number of that set A. So this K of A returns me the um, component numbers in my set, um, in my neighbor set A. And then um, for all, I'm, I'm checking for all other elements in A, so if A is just two elements in this example with the N4 neighborhood, it would be kind of the other element and say, um, is this identical to the one that I have selected? So either the minimum operation was the same, then it's all good, or there are other pixels which um, have a different number, different ID. And if this is the case, I'm just adding this number to my equivalence table. And so why is it written here with a for loop in a little bit more complicated way? That's the reason if I don't have the N4 neighborhood, but use the N8 neighborhood, then I have more elements to inspect. Then I don't have only two elements, which I may need to consider, but I have four elements that I need to consider. And then I could have, in theory, even multiple different IDs in there. And then may need to add multiple elements to this equivalence table. And then I'm done with it. I added a new element to the equivalence table and then I'm continued. 
And then in the end, what I need to do, I need to check my equivalence table and relabel my image. Um, but that's again a very straightforward operation. So with this more complicated algorithm, um, I can actually process this image in a much faster way. So we can now make an example over here. Again, this is our, our binary image. Um, and I'm going over this set. So I'm starting here and say, okay, white pixel, I don't care. White, 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 I don't care. This is the first one I'm expecting. So I'm actually putting a one in here. Here's this is the first pixel, there's no, none of the neighbors is, is black. So I'm starting a new ID. Good, it's a one over here and continuing. White pixel, white pixel, again a black, black pixel, so this pixel over here. Again, one left on the top is white or outside the image, same as doesn't exist. Um, and white, so this creates me a two. And then I'm going here, nothing, nothing, nothing. Here at that point, so I'm okay, this is a new pixel, so a three should pop up over here. Then another three here, because I'm just copying it over. Another three here, I'm copying it over. And then I'm in a situation, okay, now I'm here and I have a three over here and a one over here. So either I copy over the one or I copy over the three, depending if I take the min or the max operation. Let's say as in the algorithm before I used the min operation, so this would be a one. And then this one over here is still a black pixel, so I'd always get a one over here, a white pixel, nothing happens. In this case, I have a white and a two over here, so I'm copy over the two. They're processing again, nothing, 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 until I'm ending up here. So I have the one from here, so I'm copy down a one here, continue here, nothing, and this gets a two. And then I proceed, going on, going on, going on, until I'm here, over here, it's this pixel. It's a new number, we'll get a four over here. Nothing, nothing. Here, I'm copying over the one from top, so this would be a one, and this will be a two. And so on and so forth. So I'm pathing over this image, labeling my image. So in this example, I have my ones, three, one operation over here, and obtain my final result with the equivalence table that one equals to three and two equals to four and equals to five. So that I get out two components. One component is this component over here and the second component is this whole component over here. This now, having done this in an example for an N8 neighborhood, not an N4 neighborhood. So in this case, for that point, I don't need to take those two into account, but one, two, three, four possible pixels because those four pixels are the already visited one for this pixel over here. So I can do this for the N4 neighborhood or for the, or for the N8 neighborhood in a more or less equivalent way. Okay, so this advanced variant of connected components being computed on a grid or as a binary image as a special case for a grid um, has the advantage that it explicitly exploits the neighborhood information that I have the N4 and N8 or N8 neighborhood and I'm not connecting two pixels which are very far away. And as a result of this, we only need one pass through the image in order to label those images. Um, and I don't need to revisit it. I only need to revisit it if I want to kind of perform the corrections from my um, equivalence table and um, eliminate the, the duplicate labels so that I get unique labels, then I do a second pass. Um, but in the end, this all results in a linear complexity. That means the number of operations that I need to do only depends on the number of pixels in my image. I do it twice, but only twice, and I expect every pixel once, checking to the neighbors, which is always constant because of this fixed in four and eight neighborhood, so it doesn't add an additional complexity um, to that, and um, I can just do this with this two path through the image and then have my component image ready where all the connected components are labeled and all the component pixels have an individual ID. And this is kind of fast and commonly used algorithms for defining the connected components in an image. And that's an information which is often used if you use image interpretation. So there will be some um, algorithms running which are labeling individual pixels, say, saying, okay, this pixel may belong to a person, this pixel may belong to a car. And through this computing connected components, I can actually group pixels together and get kind of a form of a segmentation um, with those semantic information saying this is potentially or at least an hypothesis for being just one object. So one person, one car, one building in the environment. At least that's the easiest way for, of doing this is running through this so-called connected component algorithm. Okay, so let's move on and look into um, a second very commonly used technique on binary images, which is this distance transform. 
which is different to the connected component, so it doesn't have too much to do with it, but it uses a simple technique, and uh, a simple technique of going through this image. And the distance transform is something that we need if we want to compute the distance of a pixel, for example, to the foreground, or of the foreground to the background. So how far am I away from a component I'm actually interested in? So, um, and this is something which happens frequently if we perform image processing that we want to say kind of how far is a location away from the foreground or from the background or from some color value. And I want to compute for all the pixels in my image the distance to that pixel. So um, this may, for example, be relevant if I'm looking into nearest neighbors problems. I want to say, okay, how far is this pixel actually away from a structure that I'm investigating? Then if I know the distance, I can just compare um, different pixels and say, okay, they are the same distance or one is further away than the other one. This also becomes pretty relevant if you think about using um, sensors which measure the distance to obstacles. Maybe um, we have a range sensor, a laser range scanner, for example, um, or stereo camera, and we have a 3D point and want to check how far is this point away. Um, if I think about it in 3D, and not just in 2D as a 2D image, but a 3D volume, that I may want to estimate how far is a certain voxel away from a structure. Or if I project it in a 2D space and obtain an image, I want to say how far is a pixel or an endpoint that I've computed from my range sensor, for example, away from a structure that I'm interested in, from an obstacle. And these distance transforms provide me with this information, then they actually allow us to design very efficient to um, evaluate sensor models, for example, for doing robot localization on a 2D floor plan-like map. Can for every endpoint of my sensor check how far is this point away from the closest obstacle, from the closest wall, for example. And this is something I can also do. I don't need the distance transform to do it, but if I use a distance transform, this will lead to a very fast and very efficient algorithm. Therefore, it's very often used. Similar things holds for map visualizations, or for example, if I have a user interfaces on maps, and you as a user want to click on an object in that map, but you don't actually hit that object pixel precisely, um, and then you want to make click for the object you clicked on, you want to say what is the closest clickable object, so to say, and how far it is the way. So if it's larger than the th threshold, you may say the user just clicked wrongly, or if it's very close, you want, may want to assign that to a specific foreground object. And for that, distance transforms or a variant of the distance transform can also be used. So what we're doing, we want to compute for every pixel in my image the distance to the next foreground or background pixel, depending on what I'm interested in. So for every pixel, I want to get um, a value, a distance value, not an ID as it was before in the connected components, but a distance value. How far is this pixel away from the corresponding foreground or background? And that's what a distance transform is about. So we can compute this distance transform called DRC, so for row and column. So this is the row and column index um, in, my, in my image. And what I want to return for every pixel location, I want to get the distance to the closest, let's call it border, either to the foreground or to the back, between foreground and background. Okay, so what I'm doing, what I want to do is I want to return the minimum value for a pixel UV, which I don't know which one it is, but it must be on the border. So it's basically the boundary to which I want to compute the distance. So that um, the, the distance... This can be the N4 or an 8 distance, dx, specified further down here, between the pixel location that I'm querying and the pixel location on that boundary gets minimized. So I'm looking for the closest pixel on the boundary, the pixel on the boundary which is closest to my query location, and I'm returning this distance. But, if I, know, uh, but I do this only if it is um, the, the binary image gives me a 1 for the query location. That means in this case, I would, for example, compute the distance to the um, zero pixels labeled with zero. So if this is d equals one is a foreground, then I compute the distance to the background in this example. And otherwise, if this is not the case, if um, the, dis the location rc is b equals zero, that means the distance is zero because then I'm already in, um, in the, in, in, kind of inside the object that I actually want to look into. And I can use different distance functions for this. So I'm either taking the N8 or N4 neighborhood into account for saying those elements are connected. And if it's the N4 neighborhood, it's just the difference in the X or Y indices 
Um, so basically, what's the, what's the difference in x or in y? Um, and so basically, this is the Manhattan distance. And the uh, an eight neighborhood, then it's basically the maximum operation because uh, it's either horizontal, vertical, um, but then the diagonal in the end doesn't count. So this the eight neighborhood um, um, takes only the shortest distance in x or the shortest distance in, in uh, the, sorry the longest distance in x or the longest distance in y into account, and the d four neighborhood takes actually the difference in x and the difference in y into account for this distance function. Okay, let's make a concrete example how that looks like. So for example. Um, here is the kind of the my background, which I'm not interested, or my, my background, and this is my foreground, for example. And for every of those pixels here, I want to compute the distance to that background. So basically, distance to the boundary. And so you can see, basically, let's say this is a map, and this should be a lake. Can you say how far is one of those lake pixels away um, from the uh, from the boundary, from the surrounding of that lake? Just as one example. If I take the N4 neighborhood into account, this is the result that I'm actually getting. You can see this here, this pixel is one away from the boundary, it's also one away from the boundary, one away from the boundary. But this pixel is two steps away from the boundary, either one, two, or one, two, or one, two, or one, two, everything else is further away. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, whatever. So the closest one is either going along this path, this path, this path, or this path just because I'm just taking the difference in the N4 neighborhood into account. If I take the N8 distance into account, the, the uh, N8 neighborhood into account, this looks different, but the values are smaller because in this case, for example, I could just do the, the diagonal step over here, um, which I can't do here. Here I have to go through two steps, and here I can do a one step. So those elements here are diagonal elements, and as a result of this, for example, this element in here, the three, it's reduced to two because by two diagonal steps, I can actually leave my, let's say, lake or my, my foreground pixels in here. So the difference between using an eight neighborhood and an four neighborhood, that the numbers um, get are, are different from each other. These are, these are kind of the results that I want to obtain from my distance transform. So this is the output for distance transform using the N4 neighborhood, and this is the output of the distance transform using an, an eight neighborhood. And similar to before, I want to now compute this solution exploiting the structure that it is actually a grid or an image-like structure. And I want to do this again with a path through the image. Let's say similar as before going from top down, left right, or left right, top down. Um, I want to go through this image in both cases and label all the pixels. It will however turn out that I will need two paths. One from here in this direction and a second one then in the reverse order. Um, so if I do this with two steps, I can first compute all the distances kind of to the visited pixels I have seen or visited neighbors I've seen already, similar as I did it before with the connected components. And then the way back, I need to revert it because there may be a shorter path to the boundary from the other side. And I can do this for the N8 or a four and eight neighborhood. So um, the idea of computing the distance transform works very similarly to these advanced connected component algorithm that we have um, just illustrated a few minutes ago before. And um, with the connected components, I just needed to one pass and then a second pass for fixing the label IDs. Here, it's slightly different. We do one pass um, for computing basically the distance to the left and to the top and then making the a reverse pass through the image for computing all the distances from the bottom and from the right and then basically taking the minimum out of both distances because there are um, possibilities that either I'm closer to the top or the left or to the bottom and to the right and I take the minimum out of both for every pixel. So I basically have one pass top down left right and the other one um, um, down up uh, right left so in the reverse order and always store the minimum value. So um, let's do this as an example. I'm starting here with my uh, first path, let's say the N4 neighborhood. So if the N4 neighborhood, I just need to take as before the pixel to the left and from the top into account. Um, if it would be the N8 neighborhood, it would be those four elements over here. And on the reverse way, on the second pass, I'm taking those two pixels into account. So the distances from the right are from the bottom. So I start here saying, okay, the distance from here to here or from here to here is here's the distance zero, this is distance zero. So it's those, one of those two elements plus one because I need to go from here to here 
That's the cost of one, so this will be a one. So then I'm sitting over here and saying, okay, should I go from here and add one, that would be a two, or from here, which is a zero, would be a one. So it's a cost one over here. So this gets a one and one as well. One as well. And I'm sitting here saying, okay, from here or here, it's both distance one. So this must be distance two. I'm getting a two in here. And then saying, this is a one, this is a two. So this is a two because I'm copying the two over and so on. And then I'm here saying, okay, this is zero. So I had a one over here. Here it's a two, here it's a one, so it will get a two. And then I have this situation here where I said, this is a two, this is a two, so this must be a three, and so on and so forth. So in the first pass, I'm passing through my image. This will be my distance information. Very similar to before to my connected components, except that I'm not taking a component ID now into account, but a distance. I will get this distance. It basically tells me what is the distance either upwards or um, to, towards the left so that I'm reaching the boundary. So it would from the four would be one, two, three, four, or from here it would be one, two, three, four. So this is a distance of four, ignoring the borders to the bottom and to the right-hand side, only considering left or up. And <clears throat> this is what the first path did. In the second pass, I'm basically starting from the bottom up, or from, so in this order, the inverse order, and computing the distance to the left and always taking the minimum out of both distances using kind of taking those two pixels info into account. And if I do this, I'm starting here with one, it's identical. And now I'm considering this field here, which had a two in the, after the first pass by saying, okay, this was a two, but from here or from here, this is zero, zero here, zero plus one gives me one, one is smaller than two, so I can overwrite the two by a one. And here as well, this four gets overwritten by a one, this four gets overwritten by a one because this is a distance um, of zero plus one is one, same here. This two um, can't be overwritten because it was already a two before, but there's no direct connection only via this pixel or via this pixel, so this turns into gives a two, and I'm processing like this, replacing those three pixels here as well, and then this pixel in the path, but the three remains. So through this path in one direction, the path in the opposite direction, I'm actually able to compute the distance, the correct distance, um, either taking walking to the left or walking to the, um, so left, right, up, down into account, so my N4 neighborhood. And I can do actually exactly the same thing with my N4 neighborhood, except that I don't take two neighbors into account. I would take one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four neighbors into account. The rest will be identical. So using exactly the same algorithm with this neighborhood and this neighborhood in the first and the second pass, and then I'm getting basically the same or very similar analogously map. So and this will give the same result except that this pixel was a three before and now which turns into a two because I can make those diagonal movements in order to reduce the distances. And um, so with this algorithm having one path in one direction and a second path in the opposite direction, um, considering the other distance I hadn't considered before, I'm actually able to correctly compute the D4 or D8 distance transform for any pixel. And um, you, have, you have different structures, let's say. These are your, uh, the, or this is the, the pixel when I compute the distance to, and you take those points into account. This is the map that you're actually getting um, if you go for the N N4 neighborhood over here, um, or if you go for the N8 neighborhood where you can also move diagonally, then this is your field of distance information that you get if you just have one pixel and you want to compute the distance to that single pixel. Um, and again, these are distance maps, so to say, which are often computed in order to speed up operations. So if you have a lot of queries in this image, kind of how far is this pixel away from this black pixel, how far is this pixel away from the black pixel, then you can actually perform these types of operations, computing it once, and then it's just a lookup table, which makes this approach that efficient. What we looked into here are, however, not actual distances, not Euclidean distance. We just looked into N4 and N8 neighborhoods into account. Um, so I'm sorry I was already a little bit too fast. So this is exactly the algorithm for the first pass and the second pass for the N4 neighborhood. So basically the formal specification of what exactly we are doing, which I was just explaining intuitively here. Um, so this is basically um, just initialization and then this kind of first pass and second pass where I'm iterating 
over my loop and just taking the corresponding neighbors into account. So for the N4 neighborhoods, take those two neighbors into account on the way, on the down path, on the upwards path, and for the N8 neighborhoods, I'm just having more neighbors to consider, but the algorithm in the end is the same. So it's just a kind of more formal definition of what I actually intuitively described already before. What I actually wanted to talk about, um, I was a little bit too, too fast beforehand, is comparing these N4 and N8 neighborhoods and actually relaying this to the actual distance, the Euclidean distance, which is probably the thing that I'm actually interested in if I'm performing these operations. So if I look to the N4 neighborhood and look to the N8 neighborhood, it turns out that the N4 neighborhood always um, overestimates the actual Euclidean cost and the N8 neighborhood always underestimates the actual um, Euclidean distance. Um, so because you get in Euclidean distance, you're not tied to kind of 45 degree angles. There could be other angles that should be taken into account in order to compute shortest distances. But what we can do is, is can we um, find an efficient way for combining both, so the N4 and the N8 neighborhood algorithm, in order to efficiently or approximate at least or compute the Euclidean distance. It turns out that the exact computation is not that trivial to do, so the exact Euclidean distance transform or EDT how it is often called. But I can use the N4 and N8 neighborhoods which I can compute in such a, with such a simple algorithm as I showed before and combine them into a, a distance which at least approximates the Euclidean distance. So um, the real cost of a diagonal element is here the um, square root of 2 and uh, so the N4 neighborhood has a cost of 2 and the N8 neighborhood has a cost of 1 but the actually Euclidean distance would be the square root of 2 and uh, the square root of 2 is 1.41 approximately which I can say is it's 1.5 is a closer approximation of um, 1.4, it's so saying 1.5 equals to 1.41 rather than saying 1.41 equals to 2 or to 1. So if I approximate square root of 2 by 1.5, I'm actually reducing the mistake that I'm doing either for the N8 or for the N4 neighborhood. And as a result of this, if I compute the sum of the D4 and the D8 neighborhood, I'm actually exactly getting the, or the average of the two then I'm actually exactly getting the result. If I'm averaging the D, this D4 and the D8, so the N4 and N8 neighborhood, I'm actually getting something which is closer to the Euclidean distance. So what happens, what I can do is I can simply run my N8 and N4 algorithm at both distances up, um, and then in the end keep the double distance or dividing it by two, if I divide by two later on, I can exploit that I can do everything with integer computations, which can be a bit more efficient. Otherwise, I just store half of its values so that I can very efficiently combine the N4 and N8 neighborhood into an approximation of the Euclidean distance transform. If I, however, want to be, um, compute the actual Euclidean distance transform so that I can take the uh, square root of two appropriately into account and get the proper Euclidean distance, I need something which is which something which is called the Euclidean distance transform, which is somewhat more complicated to compute compared to the N8 and N4 neighborhood. And actually I need multiple paths. I need at least four paths through the image in order to do, compute this here correctly and the operations are more costly. Again, um, this is not a super costly operation, so if you use this in reality, you will probably use the Euclidean distance transform and not go for the N4 and N8 neighborhood, but the N4 and N8 neighborhood is um, distance transform um, is a, allows you to get a very good understanding of those algorithms that we can do within those binary images. Um, if you use Python, um, there is in the SciPy library uh, the distance transform or the EDT available and also in MATLAB. Uh, it's the uh, black-white distance or BW distance. These are kind of to either in MATLAB or in, in Python the functions you can directly call to get the Euclidean distance transform, which computes it in the appropriate way, but for the matter of the exercise going uh, with this um, N4-based neighborhood or an 8-based neighborhood. Um, I think what's worse to illustrate how we can actually generate efficient algorithms on these binary images to do basic operations. Um, <clears throat> last but not least, what I want to do is I want to look into uh, morphological operation, operators, especially erosion and delation, and then opening and closing, which are combinations of these algorithms, because this is an operation that is very commonly used whenever I have imperfect images. And this is something that we have always in reality and we need to kind of 
fix some of the problems or correct some of the problems that binary images typically have if I generate them from real-world data. Because the real-world data, especially if sensor data is involved, will net not be perfect or is unlikely to be perfect, and I need to take that appropriately into account. And that's something that I can do with morphological operators and do some very simple um, tricks in order to kind of improve my foreground or background mask that I have. Okay, so the question is, how are binary images typically created? Binary images are typically created by a thresholding operation. Saying, for example, oh, intensity value larger than 100 means white and smaller than 100 means black. That's kind of the simplest thresholding operation that you can do. And that's also something that we have discussed in the lecture on um, image histograms. If I create a two-bin image histogram uh, from that, then I actually obtain directly the information how many black and white pixels that I have. So with a simple thresholding information, I can generate a binary image. For example, if I say my binary image B from an input intensity value is if A is smaller than a threshold T, for example, 100, then it should be a, uh, a pixel, a black pixel, otherwise it should be a white pixel. So with this very simple operator, point operator, I can path through my image and turn my image into a black, white binary image. So just as an example, so say I have this picture here of that puppet and I perform this operation over here and I'm tweaking my parameter t until I get good results, then this is a typical outcome that I may get. So we can see, we can observe, see the puppet really well, but it's not perfect. So I can see here this metal bar, um, here are some artifacts sitting over here, some noise terms, so it's not a perfect result. It's close, but it's not perfect. But if I now want to compute um, a Euclidean distance transform, for example, those white pixels over here, they actually will completely mess up my Euclidean distance transform if I ask how far is a pixel away from, um, from that sculpture over here. So what I, I have, I have a couple of mistakes, so wrong points or even um, uh, holes in my original image which shouldn't be there and those are the things that I need to, need to want to fix. So just as a zoomed in view, this is what we have, so you can see these artifacts over here, it's the same image as before, just kind of zoomed in a bit. Or I have these holes in my original structure. Um, what I would like to have, however, is something like this. So a mask like this would be a better way, the thing that I'm actually interested in. So the question is, how can I turn this image into that image over here? And this I can do with something which, are called, which is called a morphological operator. And there are two standard, so two basic ones which are frequently used, which is called erosion or delation. And what erosion basically does, it kind of cuts away boundaries. And delation basically expands boundaries. So one makes the object a little bit larger and the other one makes the object a little bit smaller. And then based on erosion and delation, I can actually define opening and closing operations which can be used to either fill holes or remove stray pixels, these outlier pixels that are in the background, like, for example, those pixels over here. So um, with, the, with the opening operations, those things will go away, and with the closing operation, those holes should be filled. So let's understand how that works. And let's start with the erosion. So erosion basically um, changes the foreground, which is now here illustrated in black, um, and turns every foreground pixel, so every black pixel, into a white pixel if it has a neighbor that is white. So white overrides black in the neighborhood, so to say. Um, and we do this now for the N4 neighborhood, so this will all stay white. This black pixel over here has um, a white pixel in the neighborhood, so this will turn white. This one has white pixels in the neighborhood, so it will turn white. This one as well. This one in here, not, because it's only black neighbor, so this one stays black. So basically all the boundaries of those objects will be cut away in this one as well. So um, if I just kind of a zoomed in view, everything which is colored red here are exactly those black pixels which have a white neighbor and will turn into a white pixel. So I'm basically deleting all the red pixels and turning everything which is red into white. And then this would be the result. So this is the result of an erosion of my original image. So an erosion of this image turns into this image over here. Okay. Let's look in another example, which is a delation, which is kind of the opposite of the erosion. What I'm doing is, I'm now saying for every black pixel, uh, for every white pixel which has a black pixel in the neighborhood, I'm overriding the white pixel. Basically means 
I'm expanding the black pixels. So this is why it turns, stays everything white because there are only white neighbors. This point over here has a black neighbor, so this one will turn black. This one has a black neighbor, will turn black. This one, at least with the N4 neighborhood, has only white ones, will stay white. This one, however, will turn black. So I'm basically extending the boundary. It's not that I'm cutting away as in the erosion. In the delation, I'm actually adding things to the boundary. So I've again zoomed in view and I'm basically expanding all the white pixels which have a black pixel in the neighborhood and turn them black. So I'm basically making the object larger. And so this is especially nice if you have, let's say, holes in this object, those holes can, for example, be filled. I'm just expanding that object. So these are kind of two very simple so-called morphological operators which are frequently used in image processing you know, to fix some of the mistakes that we have. So in some, the erosion kind of shrinks the foreground, so the, the black pixels that we have um, over here. Um, and, the, and basically what it does, it removes outliers. So if I have individual pixels which are somewhere scattered around the space, I'm basically getting rid of those outlier points. In contrast to so this, the delation expands the foreground and uh, fills holes that I have. So if I hold inside an object, this hole will actually be filled. And um, as one makes the object larger, the other one makes the object smaller, we can combine those morphological operators into something that we call opening and closing operations, which combine erosion and delation so that the object in sum should be similar to, to what it is before by expanding and shrinking or by shrinking and extending. And, it both has different effects. The one closes holes and keeps the original size, uh, or roughly, and the other one removes outliers but still keeps the larger objects intact. So um, there are two ways to do this. One is first doing um, an erosion and then a delation, or first delation then an erosion. And these are operations which are called opening and closing. So opening consists of first performing an erosion step and then a delation step, and closing means first doing a delation step and then doing an erosion step. So what the opening does, is I'm first doing the erosion, so I'm, I'm first deleting, for example, these outlier pixels which are lying somewhere in space. I'm removing the stray pixels or outlier pixels in the background through this erosion step and then I'm trying to compensate for the mistakes that I've done through this erosion step with the delation step that are saying those pixels which are actually foreground, not just individual pixels scattered around, um, will be expanded again so that they have the original size. In the closing operation, I do the, exactly the opposite. Here the goal is to fill holes. If I have holes in my object, what I'm doing is I'm first doing a delation operation, which basically means it fills those holes, but uh, means also it makes the objects actually larger than they are in the actual foreground. And then I'm doing an erosion operation later on of actually shrinking them again, so which means I'm filling my holes, and then, um, but this makes the objects too large, and then I'm shrinking the objects again. And if I fill the hole completely, this hole will not be reopened again. So if I again have my example that we had before, so this is my original image, and this is the direct binary image that I created. If I now first run an opening operation, so that means I actually want to get rid of all those stray pixels. So first I'm kind of reducing the object completely and then expanding it. So by, by um, reducing its size, all those stray pixels here will actually go away, all the scattered space. The puppet will get a little bit smaller, uh, but then later on um, will get enlarged so that it more or less has its original size again. So if I do this, this is the result that I get, which is actually pretty nice in the sense that all the outliers that I had in the background are actually gone after this opening operation. But what I still have, I still have holes in my object. So here are holes, here are holes, just because of the noise that I had in my original, uh, in my original image. So what I then can do is I can perform the closing operation or to kind of close my holes. That means I'm first expanding, and so I'm performing expansion of the white pixels, so they will override all those black pixels over here, but will also make the object a little bit too large. And then I'm doing a delation, uh, an erosion as a second step, and removing this again. So after, if I perform the closing operation on the image I opened before, I don't recreate the noise because the noise is already gone, but I'm actually filling those holes which are remaining here. So by having combining the opening and the closing operation, first performing an opening and then a closing, which again consists of different erosion and dilation steps, I'm actually able on the one hand side 
to eliminate the outliers, fill the holes, and still have the objects at the appropriate size. And these are morphological operators which are very frequently used to get rid of noise and of outlier pixels that I will always have if I create a binary image out of a real image that I've taken with a camera or with some other um, image interpretation techniques, for example, which are more advanced than the simple thresholding. I will have outliers and this is one of the techniques that, can, that I can use and at least get rid of some of the random outliers, for example. So those morphological operators are very frequently used to actually get rid of noise and the combination of this opening and closing actually removes the stray pixel, fills the holes and are kind of standard local operators that we're using. So erosion and deletion are not point operators anymore as we have seen it um, in, in previous lectures. They are now local operators because they're taking the neighborhood into account in order to determine what intensity value we should write in our output image. So the first step towards moving away from point operators are those local operators. There are others and more advanced local operators, obviously, but it's kind of the simplest form of, or very simple form of a local operator, which takes more than the actual intensity value in an image into account in order to determine what the output image should actually look like. Um, so just as one of the examples for a non-point operator. With this, we're coming to the end of the day. So what we have done, we have introduced the idea of binary images. So what is a binary image? It's basically an image where the pixel values are, we just allow for two different pixel values, either black or white, zero or one, um, zero to 55. And here kind of the zero and one is sometimes a bit foggy what is shown in black and what is shown in white, depending if I say zero is black and one is white, or I'm talking about foreground and background, using black and, and white pixels, so you have to be a bit flexible if you, if you look to this, there's no standard notation. Typically, zero is black um, and one is white, but even the example that I've shown here, um, when I was talking about foreground and background, this notation is often somewhat different, so some flexibility uh, you have to have if you look into those different examples over here. And those binary images are very frequently computed. This could be used for um, having images or documents where just black and white information is sufficient, such as these scanned documents, for example, or when we ever do masking operations, and a lot of the things that we have done here are looking a little bit more into this masking operations, um, then binary images are a great tool because they create a mask and tell you this element belongs to my foreground, my background, my objects that I'm interested in, or this pixel does not. And for that, we then looked into different techniques. We looked into connected components, which basically connects pixels in my binary image, which belong to one component. So which, where I have a neighborhood information, so I can um, basically connect by just walking through the foreground or through the background individual pixels in my image. And we looked at two algorithms, one general connected component algorithm that works on graphs, and um, the more advanced one that we are interested in here in photogrammetry or computer vision, um, or image processing, where we exploit the fact that we actually have a grid structure. And it's again, one of these standard um, algorithms that you should know in how to do this in an efficient way by just looking into the neighbors, um, neighbor pixel that you have already seen and doing one pass um, through the image with this equivalence table in order to come up with an efficient linear time algorithm to compute these connected components. Then the second thing we look into distance transforms, one with the N8 neighborhood, one with the N4 neighborhood, and then very briefly looking into uh, the Euclidean distance transform or approximating the Euclidean distance transform, which are techniques in order to compute distances from the foreground or the background to the next boundary to the background or the foreground. So whenever distance information matters, um, which is actually fairly often the case um, in those images or in maps, then this becomes very handy because it's a pre-computation that you do once on your map image, for example, and then computing distances just turns into a all of one lookup operation. So it doesn't depend on the image itself. You just need to know which pixel you're looking into and then get the distance, informa the inf distance information to the foreground or background out, which is very efficient and therefore a commonly used technique, especially when computation speed matters. Last but not least, we looked into the standard morphological operators, erosion, deletion, opening, and closing as ways for dealing with especially noisy 
images or noisy binary images and that kind of standard operation that most techniques will actually do as a pre-processing step in order to come up with noised reduced images. So with this, that's it from my side. Again, there's standard literature. Any book on image processing will tell you more. Uh, Stravinsky book is something I could recommend here, chapter three, for example, if you want to look a little bit further and um, read things again that I've talked about or even having a more advanced view on those approaches. So with this, I say thank you very much for your attention and hope to see you soon. Thank you.